Um, it is good to see all of you here. Just a few things for today's meeting. Um, as always, email um, the info box if you have any questions for our Q&A time. Um, that's info at nwos-elca, or you can chat your questions into us. Um, you will be able, if you go to the bottom of your screen um, and hover right under the video portion, there's a chat bubble, and you should be able to message um, us directly any questions that you may have about today's topic. Um, you can so email um, if you're calling in, but then anybody else, you can chat, um, whatever works best for you. Um, another thing is that we are um, releasing later this afternoon a worship service that we hope will um, provide you and your leadership a time of Sabbath. Um, it is formatted in a way that you can use um, the service whenever you wish, whatever weekend works best for you. Um, so we just hope that this can allow um, you, your worship leaders, your council, anybody um, involved in your worship services a time of rest. We will be sending out an email that should have everything you need. We will be releasing a um, video through YouTube so you can send out a link, but we will also be providing a link to a Google Drive that will have the video file and then also an audio file for those of you who um, share your worship over the radio. And we will also be including the service in print form. So if you have people who um, maybe don't have access to um, the service through video or audio, you can still email them the service and they can be involved. Um, if there's any other formats that you need, um, as you're looking through the email, um, feel free to reach out to me directly, caroline.guy at nwos-elca.org, and we will make sure that we get that to you um, so that you still can take a time of Sabbath. Um, so I think that is everything that we have for um, our announcements, so we will pass it over to the bishop. Thanks, Caroline. I'm gonna open with, um, uh, in scripture, I'm going to open with um, Acts chapter 20, verses uh, 20 and 21. Acts, the 20th chapter. Paul is speaking to the, um, the elders from the church in Ephesus. And he says, I did not shrink from doing anything helpful, proclaiming the message to you and teaching you publicly and from house to house, as I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's from Acts chapter 20, where Paul reminds the church leaders of Ephesus of his mission to move forward, to proclaim the message, and to teach publicly. I know that a number of you have been experiencing the um, Festival of Homiletics this week. We're into day two. And this year, the focus is on the care of God's creation and so I'm going to open with the prayer that comes from the Mennonite tradition. Let us pray. Speak to us, O giver of life, and make us anew. We thirst for the waters of eternal life, and we yearn to know ourselves as resurrection people. Send your Holy Spirit upon us this day and create in us your new heaven and new earth. Speak to us words of comfort and hope, words of challenge and courage. Come, move among us, we pray. In the beautiful name of Jesus, crucified and risen for the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you for, um, for zooming in with us again this afternoon. I am grateful for your presence. Uh, last week, I was joined uh, once again by our host, Caroline Guy. She's the coordinator of communication and technology here at the Synod office. And we spent some time talking about the importance of, um, of good communication. We took a look at Acts chapter 20 and Paul's call and commitment to proclaim the message of the gospel. And many of us share that same call and that same commitment. 
We talked about three different types of meetings that are all important, which include regular standing meetings with your leadership team. And if you're talking church council, maybe you're having those meetings a little more frequently than just once a month. We talked about the importance of one-on-one -on -one meetings with pastors and deacons and, and church council presidents. And of course, the uh, special ad hoc meetings that are called as the situation warrants. We talked about that, that noble enterprise of no surprises. I won't surprise you, so please don't surprise me, church council president. I always had a, an, a standing agreement with our, with our church council that we would never surprise one another. And then Caroline did a great job of sharing some best practices around uh, social media and passing along information. We do record these Zoom meetings, so if you missed last week's meeting, know that it's available for you uh, to view on our YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, uh, type in Northwestern Ohio Synod, and be sure to subscribe, and you can view actually all of our older Zoom meetings also, and a number of our um, worship services and inspirational videos. I know that many of you are working diligently to develop and to communicate a comprehensive parish plan of return. I'm deeply grateful for your prayerful and focused work. As I shared in my email blast yesterday, the churchwide office of the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America recently published what I found to be a helpful guide. That guide is called um, Considerations for Returning to in-person worship. And I'm gonna invite um, Caroline to bring up um, the ELCA website and kind of navigate us through on how to find that document. So you go to the ELCA website, or go ahead, Caroline, if you'd lead us through. Um, so if you go to the ELCA homepage, they have a few banners on the front. Um, so you can access it easily through this one that says ELCA Church Together. Um, click learn more and this is just the easiest way that I found to access the web page um, but if you want the specific website it is elca.org slash public health um, it is the website they've been sharing all of their um, COVID-19 response materials and then at the top there's a tab that says worship resources which will take you to another page um, where you can click on um, resources for returning to in-person worship which is the considerations document and click on that and it'll open up into a PDF for you to download as you need. Great, thanks Caroline. That came out um, last week actually a little after um, our Zoom call uh, last Tuesday and um, as I read through it I just found it a helpful a helpful set of guidelines so want to commend that to you and to your parish leadership. And also when we send up the um, follow-up email for this Zoom meeting we'll embed a link um, so you can access that document um, through the email also. This afternoon, we're going to devote the rest of our time together to focus on God's gift of resiliency. We're gonna learn a little bit about the steel making process and offer an opportunity for you to join us for a deeper dive of learning and conversation. Like many of you, I try to embrace God's gift of resilience and grit, though some days have been better than others. I've heard some of the experts argue that what we are currently experiencing is a time of trauma. I talked about that a little bit last week. And trauma can have a profound effect on our intellect, our emotions, our bodies, and our spirits. I'll be honest, I've found, I have found in my personal life that my emotions are, are closer to the surface than they usually are. I find that tears come much more quickly and easily. Many of you know that our daughter Hannah is a graduating senior and on Saturday at 11, excuse me, <coughs> at 11, 10 a.m., Hannah, Rachel, and I will join our high school principal where she's going to receive her diploma with four people present. You know, I ache for her. And if I'm being honest in some ways, I think I'm aching actually more than she is. 
So trauma in even small doses, it can infect our, our state of emotions and our intellect. I've always been a reader. I love to learn. I, found, I find solace in the quiet, but even my daily reading, it's just been off. I find it much harder to concentrate and to recall what I've just read. Instead of moving forward in a book, I find myself turning back to reread some of what I've just read. It's become, I think, harder to quiet my mind and to think things through. So trauma can affect our, our mental and our emotional states. I do continue to run. That's been helpful for me during these days. Last week, I logged 25 miles, including a 10-miler on Saturday afternoon at Sidecut Park in Maumee. It was really beautiful. But even that feels different. I'm running alone. My running group that I would often run with, we've taken a break until we can all run together safely. And if I'm being honest, my running has shifted from a path to clear my mind and strengthen my body to a race to keep my anxiety in check. You know, when running shifts from keeping me fit to kind of being a fix, I know something's going on. And my hunch is that something is going on to some degree or another with all of us. Because trauma affects people differently. I read a book last year called The Body Keeps the Score. And there's a subtitle, but I can't, I can't recall it. The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. The Body Keeps the Score. This is not light reading. This is a technical book with some pretty intense stories, but I found it to be a really helpful book. I remember thinking as I was reading through it, I wish I would have known about some of this stuff as a parish pastor. For one, my ministry to combat veterans in their dying days would have been so much different. And there, I guess, lies the real gift that even in the midst of crisis and trauma, there still remains the opportunity for reflection and for growth and for the healing that comes from the living God. I'm grateful for my colleague in ministry, Deacon Sherry Krieger. She has great wisdom and she brings a wealth of experience to the Synod office. And she's going to talk with us a little bit this afternoon about the tempering of steel and also God's gift of resilience. So thank you, Sherry Krieger, and I want to say welcome to you. Well, thank you. It is good to be here with everyone. And um, as many of you know, I am a roster deacon in the ELCA, but I also have a background in social work. And so I am a licensed social worker and had 19 years experience actually in um, the mental health field and particularly specializing in crisis intervention. And so that's where I want to begin. Uh, the manifestation of crisis um, really can be either threat or opportunity. It can be something very crippling and devastating, um, or it can become liberating and healing. And so the bishop talked about trauma and coronavirus, right, that we're experiencing now um, is a can be a traumatic experience. It is true. It's trauma. But something is traumatic depending on how we respond to the event. Um, something is traumatic when it is not processed well and continues to injure us again and again. And it is traumatic if we allow it to define us and control us long after it's over. So I wanna say coronavirus is not our mission. Uh, getting out of COVID-19 experience is not our mission. It does not define who we are or whose we are. We, um, we're really at a juncture. We're at a juncture of reimagining ourselves, of resetting, of putting things in perspective, 
uh, and what it means for our lives and our leadership, for our worshiping communities, our living communities, and our life together as Synod. Um, how are we developing new partnerships and living God's vision um, of community? So as I have been kind of processing uh, this experience with the virus and the effects that it's having on us leaders, trying to find a story, an analogy, you know, a teaching that can kind of help us understand our experience. Uh, the best I have found comes from Todd Bolsinger, and that name might be familiar to some of you. Um, he wrote the book, Canoeing the Mountains. And um, I just experienced um, a little training with him, and, and that's what I want to share with you now. And so it's a little bit modified, but it is um, a version of what our experiences are. So let me throw this up. All right, resilient leaders. And let me make sure we're working here. There we go. All right, becoming a tempered leader. So why tempered? So Todd likens um, the tempering of leaders, this developing of resiliency to tempering steel. Uh, th because through that process, the metal of steel comes out tougher, yet less brittle and more resilient because of the process that it has gone through. So the metal goes through fire and hammering and what's called quenching to come out stronger, but only if the steps are followed slowly and deliberately. If not slowly and deliberately, the metal actually becomes more brittle and breaks easier. So as you can see on this slide, the anvil on the right hand side is actually an anvil that Todd used in, um, he actually took a workshop on tempering steel. So that's his anvil. Um, and these are the five steps that we're going to talk through. So walking, heating, holding, hammering, and tempering or quenching. Um, so the process begins with working, right? For those who are in the battle and not on the sidelines, you know, in the fire, not running from the flames, in the arena, not again on the sidelines. And so there's a great quote by President Theodore Roosevelt. I'm going to read just a couple sentences, but it says, it is not the critic who counts not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. And so this working, right? Um, we as staff are actually working through some of Renee Brown's work, which is actually built on that Roosevelt quote the book is called Dare to Lead. And so it's challenging us um, in some ways about how we are working and how we are in um, this experience that we're doing. Um, but that is, that is where the working begins, right? Then we go to heating. <clears throat> so heating is being in the fire, in the mix of things, but also learning as we go reflecting on the experience is, an import, is as important as, almost important, as being in the middle, right? So similar to working out, like weightlifting, muscle is actually torn down and broken when it's stressed with weight. But then it grows stronger and more resilient as it is given rest to recover. So this heating process is similar. We get heated in the experience, but we have to take time. We have to make time to reflect as well so that learning and growth can take place. So then we go to holding. Holding on to others is key to re this refining process of leadership. Knowing that we're in this together, reaching out and being reached out to builds strong bonds and tenacity that holds us together. And that is in, you know, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritual toughness that 
cannot easily be broken. And then hammering. You can see the, the image there, right? It looks pretty tough. Um, being hammered and honed and built and shaped by practice is sometimes kind of hard. But it is um, our spiritual practices that um, allow us to hear the voice of God within that hammering and that shaping. That's what helps us develop vision and mission, a mission mindset likened to Jesus. So I want to say it's not the voices of the extremists or those who are on the extreme right now or even this coronavirus itself that we need to listen to. But it is in this hammering, the surrendering to God, admitting we don't have all the answers, um, but being open to God's heart and vision and mission to shape our next steps on the journey. And then the quenching process. You know, often we want our thirst quenched immediately, but quick quenching is not helpful in this tempering process. And it actually um, is a very slow movement, a movement of cooling and tempering that builds the strength of the steel. So for us personally, that rest is important, that slow letting go of the business and overwork, um, slowly transforming our works so that we uh, become attuned to whatever it is God is telling us and is important for moving forward. So we have to let go, and we have actually, we have let go of the way that we've always done things, right? We've done that pretty, <laughs> pretty quickly um, in this experience. And we've grown stronger for it. Um, and we're doing things so much differently. And actually, we call this kind of experiential learning. We're learning in a wicked environment, right? It has not been soft and safe and easy and polite. It has been a little wicked. So our tempering, our growth happens when we rest, when we can and as we can and slowly build resolve um, to that which has changed. And we've done it and we are doing it. Uh, we still need to take care of ourselves in that process. So if you haven't rested well, you need to start today. Start right now. Start today. And folks, this message is, it's nothing new. It's nothing that you haven't heard before from probably many different places through this experience. Uh, but you are the one in control of whether you make the healthy and restful changes in your life that you need to make. And we know that God speaks best, or rather we hear God best, when we are resting and listening. So this kind of just puts it together and shows that this rest, this slow release, this hammering and this quenching are related. You know, through the practices, if you look at the image, you know, life practices, soul practices, body practices, all of those those pieces are important, but so is the rest um, that is required. And, and remember that, that rest and recovery is actually what builds the muscle, tempers the steel, and tempers us as leaders. And so this is just kind of a summary of this tempering process. And we're gonna begin up on the, the upper right-hand corner. So it is, um, the heating, when heat is applied to us, we feel it, uh, we work it, sometimes we agonize over it and in it, and sometimes we're energized by it. But the learning and the tempering process is best conducted when we reflect and debrief and work that cycle over and over again. So we're in the heat, we're out of the heat, we're in the heat, we're out of the heat. So then we moved into holding. Um, we hold on because we need it, and we hold on because others need it. Realizing that we are not alone is important. Hearing the bishop struggle with trauma and how he, his experiences have changed in this experience, that's, that's helpful. So talk and connect. Check in with others. You know, collaborate and grow together. 
moving over then we we look at the hammering it hones us it shapes us and it works best when we hold our spiritual and physical and mental practices in check right so accountability is key developing an openness to let god do god's work with us and with our community is essential to moving forward and then we move up to clenching so the key here again is slow movement out of crisis moving out of the negativity and the pressure and really then shifting our senses to allow the helpful and hopeful stress of god to shape us and give us new perspective uh, this makes all the difference for a thriving future and so you might ask what does this have to do with public teaching so that was you know kind of our um our focus from the x20 verse that bishop read earlier so public teaching is where we are interested in going with some of our work at the synod level and so what might be next uh, we want to hear from you so there in tomorrow's follow-up email there's going to be um, some information. One is a link to a leader survey that we would like all of you to take. Um, we want to hear your thoughts um, regarding your experiences, kind of where your needs are, um, so that we can respond effectively and efficiently over the beginning, the next three to six months and beyond, really. So what kind of teaching and mentoring and coaching might you be interested in? What kind of resources? And so there's there's several questions that we would really appreciate you logging in um, once Caroline sends that link out and take that survey for us. And that is for everyone. You can have other folks in your parishes uh, fill that out as well. We're also going to finally launch our NWAS Cares webpage, um, really focusing on people and purpose, parish and perspective. So we have various pages and resources that that run the gamut from you know discipleship and mission development um, to our perspective of of call process and um, lots of resources in many areas so our goal is to have that up and out and ready uh, by the first week of june and it's going to be a, a work in progress right so we've been kind of honing it and changing it and adding it and it's we've held it up because it's not perfect and i'm just telling you right now it's not perfect we're going to get it up though and we're going to we're going to improve it um, as we go and so part of that improvement is going to be hearing from you um, what might be helpful once that's up and running and then we're going to offer um, in the month of june a series of workshops um, for, it's called Leadership for Endurance, Resilience, and Transformation. We are going to limit this to five, 25 folks um, because it's a pilot. We want to begin um, and, and kind of see how it goes and, and how this might work. But we are interested in this training series on this, this idea of um, resilient leadership. Um, and moving us towards transformation. And so there's going to be a link to um, expressing your interest in participating um, in these classes. They're going to be Wednesdays beginning June 3rd. And again, it's the four Wednesdays in June. So the 3rd, the 10th, the 17th, and the 24th. It'll be from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. And um, it will be some teaching. It will be some kind of question and answer and dialogue. And then also um, an optional uh, like small group experience that we want to do some breakout rooms and and really build um, hopefully some relationships over the month related to this leadership piece. Um, I do it, uh, hope to have a, at least a half an hour conversation next Tuesday with folks who are interested, you know, in that class and then getting started the following week. So there it is leadership for endurance, resilience, and transformation on the Wednesdays in June, and you'll be able to express your interest in participating starting tomorrow in the follow-up email. And then I just wanted to kind of end on this note of seven things that we have learned um, currently um, in our experience. 
first is that God is with us, right? We know I will never leave you or forsake you, but it does help to slow down and to listen. Especially in these busy times, we must take time to be still and know that God is near and God is speaking and God is acting. We know that self-care is essential. It goes with slowing down, getting rest, getting exercise, putting on our own mask first. Why do we do that? Because if we can't breathe, you certainly aren't able to help others breathe. We have to breathe so that others can breathe as well we, when we can help. So you can't give what you don't have. And right now, many people need that deep breathing. So take care of yourself so that you can continue helping others. Number three, connections, checking in is important. Collaboration is essential. So we've heard so many amazing stories of how phone trees and designated calling and writing snail mail or call, postal love, right, has just made a difference um, in many of our parishes. There are Zoom coffee hours um, and just many different experiences that folks uh, are having and that are making a difference. So these new and amazing connections are being made. I just heard today about um, a parish that decided to have parking lot church and the neighbor who's never been to that church um, came out, sat on the front porch during church, then invited some folks over the next Sunday. And now they're talking about, hey, I think I might come back to church. So that community is changed now because they went outside of the building. So those connections and collaborations are, are important. And in these coming days, we can think about porch or window visits, you know, porch parties, even porch worship in small groups. We can do that. We can be connected. Um, and we need to be working with our teams on how to un unveil all of those and make decisions within our parishes. So we've also learned, number four, that we can do new things even um, when they're hard. And you've proved it, right? You've pivoted quickly. You have learned new technologies or utilize the capabilities of folks in your parish to assist in those changes in that technological movement. So really, again, this is a time for resetting and reinventing and creating new opportunities online and in other aspects of our ministry. So you might think of it this way, and it may be an addendum to Jesus's teaching. Blessed are the flexible, for they will never be bent out of shape. Think about that one. Blessed are the flexible, for they will never be bent out of shape. So revel, revel and be joyous in the new skills that you have developed. Number five, mission doesn't stop. And if anything, it's amplified. And so maybe we're seeing more clearly how important it is uh, for mission um, in our world, outside of our buildings. God's mission has never stopped, never will stop. And in many ways, we're getting to jump on the fast train to where God has already been. Um, and it is exciting and it's scary and it's threatening. But when has God ever been active in our lives that it wasn't exciting and scary, amazing, but a little bit threatening? Number six, let's um, you know, focus and be realistic in our expectations, be practicable. Uh, we, have been we have to focus on a lot, right? On work, on parenting, on leading, on school, basic activities like grocery shopping. You know, that's enough, that's a lot. Um, especially when all of those things are constantly changing and shifting. But as things flatten out and teams are built, um, around this newness and, and, and our new reality. Big picture thinking and problem solving, you know, it will come in time. And if your team is ready for that now, great, go for it. But if it's not, uh, that you need a little more time, that's okay too, all right? And this is a process for, for us individually, 
and us as individual parishes and us as a synod. And so there's def different levels and sometimes we get kind of intertwined in that, what we can handle individually when I think about my parish, when I think about partner parishes around us. And so all of that kind of can get confusing. Um, simple, it, dumb it down, you know, let's be simple about it and be enough for today. And finally, God um, is doing something new. God is active. God is moving. God is moving us to, um, to this newness, right? You, God has told us, behold, I make all things new. And we are different um, than we were two months ago. There is no doubt about that. And as we listen and love and serve and become more aware of our context and community, as we build community and explore discipleship, and revel in God's mysterious ways of resurrecting us, Jesus's church is taking shape in amazing ways. Uh, we are our new expressions of the body of Christ. And as our Methodist brothers and sisters say, we're fresh expressions of the body of Christ. And so, you know, we want to, we want to, to um, grow and become with you in that so that Christ's church um, is in the world as God's vision has shown us to do. And with that, I'm gonna throw it back to the bishop. Thanks, Carol. You did. Thank you, Sherry, for your teaching and for your, for your insights. I have been listening to a podcast um, from the Bible Project um, some of us became familiar with the Bible Project during last year's um, year of scripture. And right now their focus is on apocalyptic literature. And they would argue that apocalyptic literature is um, always born out of time of crisis in the church or with the people of God. And um, what I'm learning from that is that um, the church is resilient and it has been resilient. Um, and we also trust in, in the promise of, of God's presence. I'm going to shift gears now and um, see if there might be any questions that you might um, have sent in. So I'm going to ask Caroline if you wouldn't mind fielding some questions either by email or from chat. Yeah, so we have a couple questions today. Um, the first is, what is your understanding of the ELCA stand on corporate singing and liturgy responses by the congregation? Sure, yeah. So. Um, you know, Caroline, that document that you referenced, would that be hard to bring up again from the ELCA um, website? The um, considerations for returning to in-person worship? I can do that right now. Wonderful. Back on April 28th, we shared with, um, with all of you um, the parish plan of return, and um, we didn't address congregational singing, but it was about a week or two after that um, that, that that became an issue. Um, so the ELCA document does address it. So I would encourage you to take a look there. And I don't, uh, let me find, it's on page three, actually. We can go there, Caroline. At the very bottom, there's a paragraph on the bottom of page three. Um, go back up a little bit, Caroline, there you go. Um, speaking, singing, and playing instruments in worship. And there's, um, there's an excellent resource. It's a YouTube video. Um, what do science and data say about the near-term future of, of singing? And so I would encourage you to open the document and, um, and do some investigating on just what the scientists are saying about, um, about singing in a congregation. You know, when I first read that, it took me back a number of years. We were camping in Canada and the kids were really small. And we went um, on Sunday morning worship, we went to an Anglican church, a local Anglican church that was near the uh, campground, a small parish. And we arrived and the priest was upset. He's an older guy and I could tell he was angry. And he said, um, Karen didn't show up again. And I gather that Karen was either the organist or the pianist. And he said, so we're doing, we're doing nothing with song. And so he led us through the whole liturgy which in the Anglican tradition is spoken, but then he led us through every hymn, every stanza of every hymn we spoke, and it was painful. Oh, you know, we are a singing church, we Lutheran Christians, and that's just a part of our DNA. 
Um, but again, would encourage you to take a look at some of those resources as you put together your parish plan of return and think about how you're going to address that issue. The next question is um, about parking lot worship services as a first step in reopening. Mm -hmm. And what is your understanding about people not wearing masks if their windows are rolled down? Oh boy, yeah. So I think, um, you know, I think it's important that, um, that the church stays in its lane for church related issues. Um, you know, talk to your, talk to your parish about what you're going to do or not going to do with masks. Look at the health guidelines. Talk about, talk to the health, uh, county health commissioner in your area to try to figure out together through your parish plan of your return, how you're going to deal with or not deal with the mask issue. Um, I think that's, that's a local decision that I really need our parishes to have conversation about and, and make. Um, we have experienced um, parking lot worship and um, at St. Mark's in Bowling Green, and they have pretty clear parameters that, you know, windows are rolled up. So I guess if you're in your car and windows are rolled up and you're with your family, you don't necessarily need to be, to be wearing a mask. And the next question is about preschools in our churches. Um, are there any guidelines for opening up the preschools and should they be included in the return to parish life plan? Yeah, yeah you know, um, some of the questions that we're getting at the Synod office primarily relate to worship, um, especially with our parish plan of return. And I really want to encourage folks to, to think about this. It's, it's more than worship. You know, a parish plan of return, we're talking about faith formation, we're talking about Bible study, we're talking about prayer groups. And I know a number of our parishes do have either, um, uh, you know, preschools, before and after school programs. If I'm remembering right, the state of Ohio, it's May 31st when they'll be opening um, preschools and daycare centers. Again, I would really encourage you to, to work with the governor's office and to use some of those um, those um, orders and guidelines when it comes to preschools and um, and before and after school programs. Has there um, are there any recommendations on the timing of reopening worship um, or something from the synod about our recommendation for when people are allowed to come back together? Sure. Yeah, as I shared with you a few weeks ago. We again are following Governor DeWine's um, timeline and we're gonna to continue to do that. And um, according to the governor's office and Dr. Amy Atkins um, latest order, we continue to be under, under a stay at home order. I think it goes through May 29th. Um, and after May 29th, um, I, if I remember right too, we're also continuing to follow CDC guidelines that we are kind of in a phase one um, timeframe and that um, really we're supposed to be gathering with 10 people or less. And so once again, please continue to follow the guidelines of Governor DeWine and, um, and the, the guidelines of the, of the CDC. Um, what have you been learning from our ecumenical partners and um, from other bodies of worship? How has that experience been um, learning from each other um, mm -hmm. about either worshiping or just navigating um, COVID-19 from other worshiping bodies? Yeah, I think where it's where that's been especially helpful is um, with the, uh, the phone call with the governor's office. We have folks of all different traditions on that call. Um, some of them have um, entered back into in-person worship um, already a little bit a little bit earlier and um, they've shared that um, some of the um, the first group of folks that have um, uh, returned um, to, for in-person worship. Um, they found them a little, how do I want to say this? It, it was kind of interesting listening to the pastor as a Presbyterian pastor talk about this, is that first group that came back, um, he shared, kind of almost came back to prove a point um, that we don't really buy into all this pandemic stuff. And he said that was kind of an unruly crowd. They really didn't want to follow the rules or the or the guidelines or the recommendations of the, of the, of the parish. I just thought that was really fascinating. Um, so as you, again, slowly think about reopening, 
um, you might want to just think about who, who that first crowd might be. Another interesting thing that we've learned is a number of parishes have been, um, have been surveying their members and just asking the question, if we open next Sunday, would you come? And finding that um, there's a large portion of folks who are saying to them, not yet. And so again, that might be a nice resource or tool in these next couple of weeks for you too, to actually just ask your folks, you know, if we opened up with precaution and care, would you attend? Um, and if the answer is probably not, um, I would be still working on how are we going to continue to offer um, online and virtual and virtual worship. Instead of it being maybe an either or, I, I hope it continues to be kind of a, a both and. Um, I think this is um, also keeping track of time um, going to be our last question, um, but um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, still feel free to um, send it in and we'll respond to you um, directly. And then if it needs to be addressed, we'll send it out in the follow-up email as well. Um, but this question has to deal with what we're talking about today, um, about tempering. How does a rostered minister or a leader continue in a tempering process when the community element is missing, um, especially if you're... Um, sense of self-care is rooted in community and being around people. Uh, Sherry, I might have you jump in to start that. I think I can, can follow up with that too. Um, if I'm hearing the question correctly, it's when we're feeling alone and without, when, when the community might be having different ideas about self-care and things. Caroline, do you think that's what the question is? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, and also talking about how children and grandchildren being apart and the church community not being able to come together um, in the ways that we're used to. Yeah, so um, there are certainly physical and um, mental health issues that affect all of us individually and as groups, but there are ways to be connected as well. And so, you know, starting physical stuff, you can start calisthenics are a simple way just to do something jumping jacks every day you know start with five um whatever take a walk halfway around the block yes that's uh, that's being alone but we have to again we're in this kind of reshifting and redefining who we are and so sometimes you know we're being pushed a little bit to think about how we normally have done things right uh bishop has has run with a group for a while. That doesn't mean he needs to stop running now, and that has shifted, um, but we have to change that. We have to change our perspective. And you could do, you could still run with someone, um, you know, on FaceTime or checking in with each other. Let's run together um, at the same time, listening to the same, same music. It's not the same, I get that, but there are ways still to be in relationship with others um, within this process of um, doing things and shifting um, away from the, the way that we've always done things in community. Um, when, when, we, when we're surrounded by folks who don't have the same kind of, um, when we're not feeling supported and they're thinking a little differently about what self-care is, then we have to reach outside of that circle and find those folks because there are folks who can support you and and um, whether it's synod staff or other um, leaders in the area there are groups and there are people um, that we can reach out to and we might need to do that via zoom or via phone or whatever it is um, and as as we are feeling alone, it is imperative that we find those groups who do have similar thinking and, and can support us through it. And, and you know, I, I'm at home with three children and so I'm not separated from them. If they were someplace else out, you know, in the world, that would be much different too. So I know that's heartache and that's grief that, that we're dealing with, um, but, but finding those people in those communities that will support us is really important. Yeah. I think we name the reality. It stinks to be separated from people that we love. It stinks not to be able to, to worship as we, as we often have and love to do. Um, for me, it's been very helpful to um, connect with the region's six bishops here, the six of us from um, Indiana, Kentucky, 
Ohio and Michigan. I think in some ways we've been come, we've become closer um, through Zoom meetings and just conversations than we than we were previously. So I guess I would ask that you consider, you know, who are your folks who who bring you health and wholeness and are are a positive um, influence in your life and and connect and connect with them. Um, Mom and dad are going to be driving up from Florida in a couple of weeks, and um, you know um, I'm just concerned about about their drive up, their health. Um, mom wants to see grandkids, and I, I get all that, but it just there's still that concern I have because um, you know dad's going to be 80, mom's 76, and I'm concerned about their about their health. Um, yeah, so I guess just find find those areas and people in your life who can who can support you and love you. Anything else, Caroline? Um, that was our last one from today. I know we had a couple more come in, but just for time's sake, um, I think that's a good place to to end on today. Caroline, would you email me those questions that we didn't get to, and I'll try to respond to those. I will. And um, if there are a couple that look like they might be helpful for the entire group, um, so we will make sure, like I said, that we'll get those answers out to you and all of the resources that. Um, Bishop and Sherry mentioned, we'll include those in an email that will go out tomorrow. Good. Thanks, Caroline. I thought we could close together, and I'm going to ask Caroline and Jacob if they could unmute everybody. I know it's kind of, with 119 people, it's hard to, um, to have conversation, but I thought we could all pray the Lord's Prayer together, and then I'll, I'll give a blessing. I think it should be good to hear one another's voices. Can you do that, Caroline? Mm-hmm. Pray with me. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, come will be done on earth, 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 earth as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread. Bless our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Bless not trespasses. Bless not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And as a kingdom, and the glory, and the glory, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. <laughs> folks. Hey, I see Abby Ketchum waving at me. Hi, Abby. Hi, <laughs> hey, Kathy. Oh. Hey, Steve Smithberger. I see you there. Hi, Daniel. Hello. Hello. And Jim Martin, oh, nice. you got a bridge behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, Pastor Mary. Hi, Bishop. Bye-bye. And Robin Owen, I see you. Hi. Hi, and Vicki. I can hear you. Ralph. It's Ralph. Yeah. Sharon. Hello. <laughs> Bob Blom, I've not seen you in a while. Good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Bob. My son ah. Bill says he hasn't met you, Bishop, so I'm going to turn the phone. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Good to meet you. <laughs> Hi, neighbor. <laughs> Hi there, Seibert. That's right. He lives across the street from Sharon. Cool. That's Dwayne. Hi, Dwayne. <laughs> all right. Martha Michael, I see you. Uh, good to see you all. And Doris, what, do you, what kind of shirt do you have on there? Is that a jersey? This is my this is my son's um, football jersey from Tennessee State. Today is his birthday. <laughs> All right. So 35 years ago, I labored to bring him in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to celebrate too. <laughs> yes, always. Thank Since you, you do the work. <laughs> Happy Labor Day, Doris. Oh. Good to see you, Sharon. Thank you. Good to see you.
see you. Yep, and Ralph and Joe, I see you up in the corner there. Hey, thank you. Oh, good to see you all. Peace be with you all. Yeah, peace be with you all. And also with you. Thank you. You all take care. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye.